Yahweh, we just thank you for your presence that has gone before us. We just say, open up the gates, fling wide the doors. King of glory, won't you come in? Yes. Holy Spirit, we just make room for you. Come and take center stage across this place. And we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Hey, welcome to the Altar Fellowship, a place where we do two things, worship and family. If this is your first time here, we just welcome you. This is a house of freedom, so you can step out of your seat. You are free to just worship the Lord as you as your heart so long desires. So we thank you for freedom in this place, Holy Spirit. Come on, all across this place, just lift up your hands. Say, thank you for freedom. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. The Father calls us home. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, just 30 seconds. Just release your own song, your own sound to Him.
crimson robes draped over the ashes a wide open tomb where there should be a casket the children are singing they're dancing and laughing the father is welcoming this is our homecoming roses in bloom push up from the ears the rivers of tears flow from good times
about me but I just want to say do you guys know how rad it is that we are in a church where someone as weird looking as me can say there's only two things that are sure in life death and taxes now there's only one sure thing in life and taxes and none of y'all have a religious spirit that got offended I'm just saying you guys celebrate this family let us not divorce ourselves from one another this is family and it is good to be in the house free of religion. Yeah.
throughout scripture, throughout the Psalms, throughout Revelation. Anytime we, we read about them catching a glimpse of who he is, it always demands a response. 
right? It always demands that we respond to what we are seeing. seeing. And sometimes that's singing, sometimes it's dancing, sometimes it's laying down, sometimes it's standing in reverence. But in, in the book of Revelation, it's, there's this song, this everlasting song. And it's every time that they, they cry, holy, 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 and they see him for who he is, it says they all take off their crowns and they lay it at his feet. Because there's only one worthy of the crown this morning. It's only one worthy of all of our success, all of our failures. There anything that we could take as an identity, we just lay at his feet this morning. So Jesus, we just say, receive your reward. Receive the reward of your suffering. It says that we were the joy set before you that you endured the cross. You drank the cup. You were enthroned in glory. You're enthroned in majesty, seated above the circle of the earth. All of heaven, all of creation adores you this morning. So we just join in the song. We join in the response. We say, we lay our crowns down at your feet this morning. All that we are. Come on, just whatever that thing is that you hold really tightly, just give it to him this morning. trust in our finances or our resources, unforgiveness, maybe pain, sorrow, maybe success, anything that stands in the way of seeing him as the King of kings and Lord of lords, the sustainer and creator of all things. We just give it to you this morning, Jesus. sing enthroned in glory. So 
Well, with every eye closed, let's, uh, let's behold him. Let's let our soul bear witness to the beauty and the majesty of the lamb who sits upon the throne. Jesus, you are worthy of all we could ever give you and infinitely more. 
Jesus, you are worthy of all we could ever give you and infinitely more. Jesus, you deserve it all, every heart, all affection, all attention, all applause. Jesus, our Savior, our God, our King, and our friend, we stand in awe of you this morning. You are holy. You are worthy. You are lovely. You are glorious. You are majestic. You are beautiful. You are righteous. You are pure. You are true. You are faithful. Jesus, you're the lover of our souls. the faithful keeper of our fate. And we thank you for loving us today. We come here just to say thank you, Jesus, for loving us. There is no greater privilege, no greater honor, and no greater grace than to be loved by you. But thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Listen, uh, just uh, a few minutes ago, Pastor Zach said something that, that really stirred me. He said, you know, when you have a, a revelation of the holiness of God, it demands a response. And, uh, and I know that normally here we, you know, go find our seats and we uh, spend a few minutes talking about the offering. But the truth is, I'm not asking you to give to me or to... The, the organization that my family and I started. Uh, this morning, I want us to give as an act of response to the revelation of the holiness of God. God is in this room. Could you feel him this morning? The presence and the power of God is in this room. And I think it would be a great tragedy and a great insult to him for us to just move on with business as usual. Understand the response that the revelation of his holiness demands. Maybe, maybe that response at times is to dance or to laugh or to run or to shout. I think that response for all of us ought to be to lay our lives down. But in, in moments like this, it's, it's so easy to just move on with business as usual and, and to try to force things to be normal or the way that we expect. But I feel like there's such a, a weighty holiness in the room this morning that I, I want to make sure that we are responding to the right thing. And so without turning the lights up, without going back to find your seat, if I could get my offering team to bring the, the buckets up, this is what we're going to do. We're going to stay in a place of worship. We're going to stay in a place of adoration. And we're going to give this morning as an act of worship. This is going to be our response to the revelation of the love of God, the beauty of God, the majesty of God, the holiness of God. One of the most audacious prayers we ever prayed. I think most of you are aware I, I played in a band for a long time. And, and, uh, and we approached our time in that band like a ministry. And we had this box that would set on the front of the stage every single night and on the front of this box, we had spray painted this message. May our praise be in proportion to his glory. So that every night the crowd, you know, they would, uh, they would see the band, but what the band would be looking at is the back of this box that said, may our praise be in proportion to his glory. May we give him great as the Lord and greatly to be praised, right? May we give him the kind of praise that that his goodness demands, that his holiness demands, that his truth demands, that his wisdom demands, that his love, his holiness demands. And so as we give this morning, let's give in proportion to his generosity to us. Let's give in proportion to his glory. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. If the Lord has been great to you, then I would expect you to give greatly this morning. If the Lord has been uh, 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 wonderful to you, then I would expect you to give wonderfully back to him this morning. 
If the Lord has been kind to you, then I would expect you to give kindly this morning. Understand this is our chance to turn back to God and and to tell him what we see when we look at him. His holiness in this place demands a response, amen? So as you know, there, there are three ways that you can give. You can give by cash, check, or card using the envelope in the seat in front of you. You can uh, scan the code there on the screen, or you can text give and the, uh, give in the dollar amount to the number there on the screen if you'd like to give online. But before you come forward, um, I want to just uh, take a minute to pray. Let's just turn our, our eyes and our hearts to him. Abba, Father, Lord, you were faithful to us when we were unfaithful to you. You pursued us before we ever pursued you. You sought us before we ever sought you. And because you sought us, you carried us into your family and gave us a seat at the table. Lord, we stand in awe of you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your faithful kindness. And we give this morning greatly because Lord, you are great. We give this morning generously because you are generous. We give this morning extravagantly because you are extravagant. Lord, may our praise be in proportion to your glory. Let our praise be in proportion to your glory. Let our praise be in proportion to your glory. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to give something as temporary as money to change eternity, not just for ourselves, but for those around us and even for those coming after us for the next generation. Lord, we ask you to use every dollar given into this offering to advance your kingdom, to transform lives, and to glorify your son in this generation. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, as we continue in worship, uh, let's, let's let our giving this morning be an act of worship and an act in response to the glory of the Lord the holiness of God as it's revealed in this place. You can come forward now. Thank you. Hey, Alter TV family, Pastor Maddie here. You know, as we are giving our tithes and offerings right now at the Altar Fellowship, I want to extend an invitation to you as well to partner financially with our ministry and to help the message of the kingdom continue to impact lives around the world. So if you've been blessed by the altar in any way, if you want to help build the special thing that Yahweh is doing here, you can click the button marked giving located on on the bottom of your screen just below this video. Uh, If you'd like to give by check or money order, you can mail them to us at the address uh, that's also located on the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions about other ways you might be able to partner with the Altar Fellowship, please don't hesitate to contact us directly by emailing office at the altar.org. Thank you so much for joining your faith with ours today. As we work to establish, advance, and proclaim the kingdom, it's a, a constant encouragement to know that we have family like you who are willing to partner with us for the sake of the gospel. Please know that we are praying for you, we love you, and we are glad to call you family. God bless you, and we hope to see you here in East Tennessee very soon.
morning. Good morning. You can ha find your seat. I just have a few announcements for you. Coming up on October 21st from 9 to 12, we are going to be having an altar students worship workshop. So if you have some, this is an awesome opportunity for your um, student, whether they're in middle school or high school, to grow in their gift of music if they're an instrumentalist or a singer. Um, our worship team is going to be intentionally pouring into them during this time. And you can register um, through emailing Pastor Seth um, at seth at the altar.org. So be sure to sign your students up for that. The next announcement we have is worship team auditions. So if you are interested in serving on the worship team, uh, we would love to um, have you a part of the audition. You can email uh, rachel at the altar.org to sign up. That will be on October 24th. Uh, it's during our practice time on Tuesday nights. Uh, our last announcement is our kids fall party. So this is gonna be fun. Your kids can dress up, but they can dress up as a Bible character, an animal, or a church staff member. <laughs> I want to see this. So parents, be creative, have fun. Uh, we will be taking um, any candy donations. So if you want to in any way help out, uh, you can email Pastor Anna. But we'll be taking candy donations every Sunday and Wednesday night, and you can um, drop them off at the kids' check-in table. Uh, this is going to be a just during our Sunday morning service, so it will be uh, fall games and snacks provided. So your kids are welcome to dress up uh, in a Bible character, an animal, or a church staff member. So have fun with that. If you'll please stand and honor Pastor Maddie as he brings the word today. Oh, it's good to see you this morning. You can be seated. Today, we're going to talk about roasting what we kill. We're going to talk about finishing what we start. If you remember last week, I, I stood here and I, I, uh, I took ownership of some of the areas of my life that I had been living in less than God's best for me. Uh, my, uh, specifically for me, it was my uh, physical fitness and uh, in my education, uh, my educational development or academic development, and uh, both of those are areas that I've taken uh, steps to, to to rectify and, and to raise the standard for myself. In fact, I start school again tomorrow. Uh, and uh, let's go. Let's go college, baby. Let's do it. <laughs> it's gonna be good. I, if you see me running around with like a backpack and a a graphing calculator, just pray for me. <laughs> pray for me twice that day. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's been amazing some of the feedback that I've gotten over this last week. Some of you, you know, I'm hearing people say, hey, you know, I'm, it's time for me to start a, a weight loss journey of my own. Some people are saying, hey, it's time for me to finally, I'm gonna take the step, I'm gonna start that business that God has put on my heart. Some of you are saying, hey, you know what, I've been waiting to continue writing this book uh, that I've been working on for ages and it's time for me to finish you know, what I started. I, I'm gonna honor the Lord and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, raise my life to the best that he has for me, you know, to, to God's best for me. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that book. I'm gonna work on that album. I'm gonna launch that business. And I, I've been so inspired, so encouraged at the people who've really taken ownership of, of, of that message and taken ownership of their, their life and their choices and, and their situation. I'm so thrilled. And so this week, I want us to take it to another level and for us to understand it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful, healthy, and valuable for us to have a good start. But a good start means nothing if we don't have a good finish. We've got to see through to completion the, uh, the tasks that the Lord has set in front of us. And so I'm going to share with you something that, that really kind of captured my my imagination just a couple months ago, I read a, an article by a, a man named Greg Morse who had uh, written about, uh, about this verse in, in Proverbs chapter 12, 27. And uh, in, in the article, or sorry, the, the verse, it says this, Proverbs 12, 27. It says, the lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting, but diligence is man's precious possession. 
The lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting. Now, uh, this is especially uh, interesting because I, I am a hunter. There's a, uh, uh, and have been for, for years now. And, you know, the thing about hunting is hunting's not easy. And so for a man to take something hunting at all means that this man started strong. I mean, if you're going to get an animal hunting, it means, you know, you don't start the morning of the hunt. You, you start planning months in advance. You know, you scout game trails and you look for rubs and wallows and water holes and you, you know, you plan for, for months. Where is it exactly that I'm going to have the best opportunity to take this animal? And then when hunting season starts, you know, you, you've got to be uh, uh, geared out with your camo. You got to look cool. The deer won't come to you. And then, uh, <laughs> You know, and then you've got to be proficient with your weapon, your gun or your bow. And that takes months or maybe years to get confident and competent in, in the, the utilization of, of a weapon to be able to effectively take an animal. And then you, you know, you wake up early and you get out there before the sun and you check the wind and make sure that you're in, in, in make sure that you're uh, uh, upwind or sorry, downwind from the animal so that the, the animal can't smell you and you you know, you carry yourself strategically, every step, every breath, where you position yourself as the sun is coming up. You know, you get on the animal and you calm your nerves and you, you put your skill to the test and you make the shot effectively. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. And, uh, and so the picture that's being painted here in Proverbs 12, 27, as it describes the lazy man, it's not a man without skill and it's not a man without drive. It is a man without the perseverance to finish what he starts. I want to explain it like this. You know, when I think about a lazy man, I think about, you know, a guy who's 40 and he's living in his mom's basement and he just sits around and, you know, plays video games and eats nachos all day and doesn't have a job and he doesn't have a woman and he's not contributing anything to society. When I, you know, when I think about a lazy man, I think about a man that has no skill and has no drive and makes no contribution to, to anyone. But Proverbs chapter 12, it, it sort of paints a, a different picture for us of what a lazy man is. See, this isn't a man who doesn't have a job. Oh no, this is a man who's had many jobs. This isn't a man who doesn't have a, a woman. This is a man who's had many women. See, this is the kind of man that starts strong and then fades out later. He woke up early. He he put himself in position to take the animal. He trained for months getting ready for this hunt. He made the shot. He had the skill and the ambition, the ability to be able to successfully make the shot. He, he took the animal. And then once he got it, he lost interest. Now, I wonder how many of us can relate to that. You know, there's this epidemic in, uh, uh, among young men of wanting to to date women, you want to pursue a woman and get her to date you and like you and want you, and then, you know, four months down the road, you, you lose interest. Or maybe that's not relevant for you. Maybe it's something more like you join a new church and you're so excited. This is the best church I've ever been a part of. Oh my gosh, this church is amazing, you know? And then four months or six months or 12 months later, ah, you lose interest. I worked really hard for, you know, I volunteered, I contributed, I served, I made all these friends. I was, I was totally in, right? I, I put in the skill or, or the effort necessary to develop the skill. I, I brought my talents to the table. I did everything right up front, but uh, it's just not as exciting as it was at first. You know, any person who's hunted for any amount of time will tell you when you pull the trigger, that's when the work starts. You got to go track that. If it's Pastor Zach, you got to go track that animal for like three miles. You know, it shoots him in the back leg for some reason. Like, it's just the worst. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, uh, you know, and then you've got to skin and quarter them. You got to gut them. You got to carry the meat out. Then you have to butcher the meat and prepare the meat. It takes ages. I mean, hours and hours. I remember I shot a bear a couple years ago. Uh, of course, I did it on a Saturday night, and Pastor Zach came over to help me skin it. We were out till like four o'clock in the morning, you know, skinning and quartering this bear, and he kept the meat, and we, uh, and then we, we, I just, I got the rug now in my in my basement, and so, 
Um, you know, it's not a short process to be able to, to, to roast what you took in hunting. Or maybe it's something like this. Um, man, I got this amazing new job opportunity. It's going to be an awesome chance for me to be around great people, to do things that I am interested in. I'm going to use my skills and abilities in, in a, a wonderful way, and I'm going to be able to provide for myself while I do it. I cannot wait to begin this job. And then we jump into the job, and it's awesome and wonderful, and then we find out that all the people that we work with are people just like us. And they're kind of obnoxious sometimes, you know, and they're kind of irrational sometimes, and they're not always fun to be around. And you know, you show up at eight o'clock in the morning and not everybody's delightful and sunny and bubbly like you are. And so it's like, you know, what do we call it? A toxic, it's a toxic work environment, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then we give up and we leave and we just move on to something else. Just make a lateral change just because we want the change. We see people do this all the time. I see people do this all the time. They have the character and, and maybe the resume and the skill necessary to to uh, get an opportunity, to lay hold of an opportunity, but they don't have the character to be able to steward that opportunity over the course of, of time. What I find often is that immature believers, and, and this is probably, you could probably see this impulse or, or this uh, habit, this sort of character trait increasing from one generation to the next, to the next, is that we, we become more and more sort of anxious about our current situation and more and more eager to jump from one situation to the next situation. But what maturity looks like is the ability to persevere, to endure. It is laziness that causes us to um, falter. According to Proverbs chapter 12, it's laziness that causes us to falter while walking the road the Lord has called us to walk. It's, it's not... Um, distraction or compromise. It's not the temptation of the devil. <laughs> it's personal laziness. It's that we are not uh, hardworking enough. We're not determined enough to finish what we started. I mean, I'm, I won't make you raise your hands, but I wonder, you know, how many of you promised yourself at one point in your life you were going to write that book? You know, how many of you have actually delivered on that book? How many of you have promised in fact, uh, hey, Browns, hey, guys, I know that we have not had a conversation ever, really, but today in worship, I was looking at you, and I felt like the Lord said, I, so I saw this picture of, of God holding like a, something like a snow globe, and, um, and I, I felt like he said over your family specifically that there's a, a dream that you dreamed with God about ministry that maybe you have put on a shelf, but he hasn't forgotten. And, uh, and that, that he still remembers dreaming with you. And that, that dream that you had when you were younger, that's still his dream. And it may seem more difficult now, but he's never even let it get dusty. Like he, it's still precious to him, you know? Um, and so I, I want you to know that there's still ahead of you, like the doors that have been closed behind you, bridges burned behind you, irrelevant. God has, has actually gone before you and he's made the way straight for you to be able to step into the dream that you dreamed when you were younger. Uh, and so I want you to know, he, he remembers. I say, I think the name Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. And so I say, Zechariah, over the two of you, Yahweh remembers the dream that you dreamed when you were young together. Amen? All right. And I don't think you're the only ones. I think there's other people that God is saying he remembers the dream that you dreamed together when you, when you were young. But I think there's something really special about the two of you. I can't wait to hear what the Lord is, is going to do, what he's going to uncover that you may have thought was buried, but he, he hasn't forgotten. Um, and so uh, we've got to recognize that uh, as, as kingdom people, if we're going to be kingdom people, we've got to be the kind of people that can endure through hardship. We can endure through suffering. We can endure through disappointment. We can en endure through uh, shifting circumstances or situations. And we can we can say, no, if God said it, I'm going to do it. If this is what God gave me, I'm going to finish it. I'm, I'm going to be able to say that I have run the race that was, that was before me. I've fought the good fight of faith. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to say that I did what he sent me to do. You know, I remember in, in 2016, at the beginning of the year, 
Uh, I'd been touring at that point for about nine years with the band that I, I played in. And, and, uh, and I'll never forget the first show of this tour, the first show of that year in 2016, we played a concert in Austin, Texas. And uh, I remember we walked off the stage and I was standing in the backstage area and I'm you know, wiping the sweat off my face. And, and I remember thinking something about this feels different than it ever has before. I've done this a thousand times. I've played countless shows all over the world, but something feels off today. And I texted my wife maybe the next day or, or the day after that. And I said, hey, will you just pray with me? Like something feels weird about this this uh, tour. It just doesn't feel right. And I, I spent, it was a three week long tour. I spent the next three weeks saying, Lord, give me a passion for this. This just, it feels like it doesn't fit anymore. Give, if this is where you have me, give me genuine passion to be here. And, uh, and as the, 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 the weeks went on on this tour, I, 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 I started to have this sense that maybe the father was calling me away from the band. Now that's all I had done for essentially my entire adult life. It's what I'd done for a decade at that point. And I, I just didn't know what I would do afterwards. I didn't know what life would look like. I didn't know how I would support my family. I couldn't imagine life not being the vocalist of this band. And so, uh, and so I would just ask God, you know, what's wrong? Is there something wrong with me or my heart or my approach to ministry? Is there something wrong? We can fix it. And, uh, and what happened is uh, after about three weeks, uh, I was walking in a, a parking lot just praying. And, and the father said, um, Maddie, there's nothing wrong. You have just finished what I gave you to do. And so the Lord said, I am finished giving you grace to play in this band. And you can keep playing if you want to, but you're going to have to do it without me. And I said, okay. Here's, here's the thing. Every one of us in this room who's walked with God for any amount of time we have walked on after God turned at one point or another. We've continued straight because we don't know what that path looks like. That's unfamiliar to, I'm just gonna keep doing what I've been doing, right? But, um, but the Lord said, Maddie, you've, you've finished what I've called you to do. There's nothing wrong. It's not like a failure. It wasn't a punishment for us to finish our time in the band. It wasn't like me and the guys, you know, in the band hated each other and couldn't get along. It wasn't like, the, the fans hated us and we couldn't afford to keep playing concerts. Things were going great for us financially, professionally, socially, everything was fine. But God just said, my grace is lifting. And uh, if you know what's good for you, <laughs> you'll follow me. You'll go where the presence is. And, uh, and so we did, we finished. And it was interesting how many people, even ministry professionals, could not imagine why I would ever walk away from a successful, fruitful, effective ministry. Why would you ever step away from, you get to stand on stage and thousands of adoring fans every night and you're making good money and you're reaching all these people with the gospel and how could you ever lay that down? And I, and I said, well, I, because I want to finish well. So I want to go where the grace is. Now, I'll never forget talking to uh, my friend Corey Russell. He said, man, it's incredible to hear you say this. He said, I, I could count on one hand the number of times I've seen people finish something well. We hang on way too long because we don't know what we would be without this thing. And, and then it gets weird and squirrely. God loves us enough too much to let us continue on in rebellion and, and disobedience. And so it falls apart and it's miserable and it's painful and God forces us out of this situation because of his jealousy for our life. And, um, and I remember, you know, as we were finishing our season in this band in 2016, I, I just felt this great sense of peace and rest and, and accomplishment. Like, man, I want to be a person that finishes well. I want to be a person that crosses the finish line, knowing that I have to the best of my ability followed the careful instruction of God. That takes a commitment, a conviction within us to be more devoted to the presence of God, to the word of God, than we are to the success or applause of man or even to our financial security or stability. We have to be a people that will follow him no matter what. I want to go to Ecclesiastes chapter five. Ecclesiastes five, verses four through six. Now, um, 
I love this verse, or, or I love this passage. This is really good. It, it says this, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4. I, it, I'll never forget when I read this. Part of a, a group of young men, you know, 12, 13 years ago, and, uh, and all of us were kind of exploring fasting, trying to figure out what it means to fast. And then I, I read this verse in Ecclesiastes 5, and, uh, and I thought, I can never, if I say I'm going to fast for 30 days, I better follow through. It says this, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Let's go. This is, I love that this is in the Bible, so you guys can't get mad at me for saying it to you. <laughs> I'm so grateful. He takes no pleasure in what? There it is. So what does it make you if you break a vow you made to God? That's great. You guys... You said it. Here's, here's the thing. I couldn't begin to count the number of people who told me, and this is just in, in, in my unique perspective and position, who told me, God has called me to be a part of this church who aren't here today. He's, God said it. I don't know. <laughs> Listen, you don't have to say that to me for me to like you. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I don't I'm not worried about it. There's some of my favorite people on the planet don't go to this church. It's okay. It's okay if you're not called to this church. However, if you tell me God has called me to this church, then I expect you to act like God has called you to this church. I couldn't tell you the number of people who have said, God has called me to marry this person. Six months, five years, 20 years later, they decide, I can't take it anymore. We just fell out of love, right? Oh, it's just, uh, we, we don't connect anymore and everything is awful. And oh, by the way, there's this young secretary at work that I get along with way better. You know, here's the thing. I understand that your marriage might be hard, but you made a promise. That should be the end of it. You made a promise. That's it. Keep that promise. If you, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. He has no pleasure in fools. Understand what it looks like to be a person who's spiritually mature, a man or a woman of honor, is that we would have the integrity and the internal fortitude to do what we say we will do. When it's hard, when it's painful, when it's inconvenient, when we're disappointed, when we're offended, when we're distracted, when we're tempted, that we would come back and say, I made a promise. That's the end of it. There is no more debate to be had. I made a promise. End of story. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Verse 5, it continues on. Verse five continues on here, and it, and it says, uh, uh, better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Now, this is probably a principle that all of us should hear. It is better not to make a promise to God than it is to make a promise to God and then change your mind later. This should go without saying. Here's what I mean. You should be very, very cautious about the commitments that you make. Because when you make a commitment, people should know they can build their life on it. You will follow through with what you say you'll do. My, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never forget uh, waiting for Candace to get the revelation that she was supposed to marry me. It took her longer than it should have, you know. <laughs> she got there eventually. But, uh, <laughs> You know, I'll never forget, because we were far apart. I was playing in a band on tour all the time, and we were based in the Midwest, and she lived in, the, in Birmingham, Alabama. And so, uh, I, you know, I'd see her when we would come through Birmingham, which was maybe twice a year, maybe three times if we were lucky. And, uh, you know, I, I believed that the Lord had spoken to me, that we were supposed to be married. And, and uh, you know, she had said that she had believed that as well. And so we were sort of waiting on the Lord. But, you know, the question kept arising, well, what if, you know, what if she doesn't hold up her end of the bargain, right? What if she decides she doesn't want to go through with this? Or what if some other guy comes in and he's just irresistible? <laughs> as if. And, uh, 
you know, and she, she just couldn't, right? And, and so maybe it, maybe it wouldn't work out. And, and I, I was stressed about this. Okay, Lord, what, is it, what does it look like? And, you know, I remember praying and, and coming out of prayer with this holy determination, thinking I have been called by God to love that woman for the rest of my life. And if she won't marry me, I'll just wait until her husband dies. <laughs> and then I'll marry her then. Like, that'll be my sign that I'm going to take a vow of celibacy. I will love that woman for the rest of my life, and there's nothing she can do to stop me. I'm going to love her forever. Like, that, a, a genuinely, as a 20-year-old, 20 21-year-old young man, that was my conviction level. Like, I was willing to say, I will do my part no matter what she does. I'm going to love her no matter what. If she, I, I pray to God she never gets tired of me and leaves me for another man because if she does, I'll just sell my house and move in next door to them. Like I'm gonna keep, <laughs> I'm gonna keep loving her for the rest of my life. She's not getting rid of me that easy, you know? We, uh, so I, I, I say this to say, like that, that has to be our level of devotion. That if I say this is what God's called me to, it can't depend on the performance of someone else. You know, uh, now, Gosh, 11 or 12 years ago when I met my spiritual father, the Lord called me into covenant relationship with him. And, and I promise that there have been more than a couple times that I have thought, man, I'm pretty uncomfortable with what he's saying. I don't, I fully disagree with what he's doing right now. I don't, you know, I didn't like or love or agree with or endorse everything that he did, but there was never a question in, in me about breaking that relationship. God called me into that relationship. That's the end of it for me. That doesn't mean I like everything that happens in the relationship. It doesn't mean it's always easy, but it means there, there is no possibility that I'm going to end the relationship because I made a vow. I gave my word. And so it's settled for me. I'm not going anywhere. Is this making any sense to anybody? When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. I love this next part, verse six. It says, do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. I love this. Uh, that maybe I'm being presumptuous, you know, looking at myself as a pastor, as the messenger of God. So if you're offended by this, you know, pray for me. Uh, but I love that it says, nor, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. It's like, you know, how many people have come to me with a word from the Lord and then come to me later like, ah, that was a mistake. That wasn't really the word of the Lord. It's like, listen, I, I would rather you follow through with something that, uh, that God didn't want you to do than for you to um, say, this is the word of the Lord and then compromise or negotiate it later. God's desire is for you to be a person that finishes what you start. God's desire is to you to, for you to be the kind of person who roasts what you kill, who crosses the finish line of the path that he set you on. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. It's like, let me make this really practical. Uh, you know, if, if God calls you to do a 40-day water-only fast, you better be sure that God called you to do that. <laughs> and then you better not get 10 days in and decide this is too hard. I'm gonna quit now. Don't let your mouth cause your flesh. It would be better to not commit to it in the first place. It would be better to say, I'm just gonna fast for a while. We'll see what happens, right? Unless you know that this is what God has called. It's like young men, it, you don't have to, listen, I understand if you were raised in the church, this is probably how you have been taught to approach dating relationships, to think that every girl that makes direct eye contact with you is God's, you know, <laughs> preordained helpmate for your life. But, but listen, first of all, chill out. <laughs> Second of all, it's totally fine to say, hey, we're going to go on some dates and there is no pressure to make it anything more than that. We don't have to fall madly in love with each other. You know, we don't, I don't have to come up with some 
prophetic word, like I saw a shooting star on the way over to her house, and that's how I knew the Lord wanted us to be together. Like, stop. Just date, man. You know, it, instead of saying the Lord, thus saith the Lord, we have to be, covenant ourselves together forever. How about this? Go on some dates. See if you like this girl. Maybe she's got bad breath. You know, like just spend some time with her before you start saying thus saith the Lord, right? If you're called to fast for 40 days, if you think you might be called to fast for 40 days, instead of going around telling everybody, the Lord told me I am to fast for 40 days. How about this? Just start fasting. And go as long as God's grace will allow you to go. And if it's 40 days, oh, praise God. If it's 10 days, if it's 10 hours, then like, hey, praise God, you know, you got some extra time of prayer in. It's cool. But when you start running around telling everybody, I'm going to marry this girl or I'm going to fast for 40 hours, we should be able to expect you're going to finish what you start. Be careful with what you commit yourself to. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? How many of you know who Ronald Wayne is? Oh, it's weird that nobody jumped all over that. You you could know who Ronald Wayne was. Ronald Wayne, um, he was one of three guys that started a business in 1976. The business, uh, you know, it didn't take off immediately. It was kind of in a niche industry um, that not too many people knew very much about. So, you know, he helped these guys start this business and, and he was a 10% owner in it. And so he sold his 10% stake in this business just a few months after they launched for $800. And he thought, man, that's a good payout for you know, the work that I've done uh, helping build this thing. And we'll just, you know, see what these guys turn this into. These other two guys, their names were um, Steve and Steve. And, uh, and they turned their business, Apple Computers, into a pretty successful enterprise. And so Ronald Wayne's 10% stake that he sold for $800 in 1976 would be worth an estimated $270 billion today. I f- feel like if I was Ronald Wayne, I would never sleep again. Like, <laughs> man, that's a tough pill to swallow, right? Here's the thing. Uh, finish what you start. See it through to completion. Maybe you get bored. Maybe you get distracted. Maybe you think, eh, this is all that's ever gonna come from it. But when you sell out, Before God is finished, you never know what you might lose. So we've got to ask the question, you know, why do people break their vows? Why do people fail to to maybe follow through with the commitments that they've made? I just want to give you two reasons as I see it. Uh, Number one, they, they, and this is an interesting one, they start soft. Here's what I mean. Uh, All the time in business, in ministry, in leadership, I meet people who, um, who look at what they're doing and they say, well, it's only small. It's small now. I'm only just beginning. And so what they do, they do poorly. And this is my, uh, this is anyone on my staff will tell you that is in direct contradiction with my leadership strategy. If we can't do something uh, at an elite level, we won't do it at all. Like I, I would rather just plug in a Bluetooth speaker and worship to that than to have some poor, you know, broke down worship set that sounds awful and looks even worse. Like if we're going to do it, we're going to do it really, really well. We had the opportunity to start. You can take that verse off. It's distracting me. Uh, you know, we, we, when we started a, a, our church, we had the opportunity to do live stream, for example, right away. We had the money to do it. Our friends at Upper Room are willing to help us you know, set up a system similar to theirs. We were going to have a camera in the back of the room and do live stream straight to social media. And, um, and I said, no, I mean, we don't even have a whole worship band yet. We don't have any lights. I I feel like we need a a team of people to do a world-class job at this. And I understand that no one's expecting a world-class job from a brand new church, but I would rather do what we do with excellence than do what other churches do in a, in a mediocre way right? 
Instead of competing with everybody else, like I, I want to do whatever God gives us to do, whatever we can do, I want to do it with elite excellence for the glory of God. And so what I see people doing, and, and one of the reasons that I see people fail is that they start soft, they start sloppy. They say, well, it's only beginning. My business is beginning, so it's fine if I do a bad job. You know, maybe you're starting a business detailing cars, and you're saying, well, you know, I'm just starting out, and so it's fine if I do a bad job. You're starting a business cleaning houses, or you're starting a business, you know, f- flipping homes, or building, you know, multi, uh, multifamily housing units. It's wonderful, but don't let yourself off the hook just because you, you're, you're just beginning. What we do has to be excellent, even if what we do is small. Like I'm old enough to remember, I'm sure you've heard of a corporation called Under Armour. I'm old enough to remember when Under Armour first started, they only did one thing. They did long shirts, you know, long spandex shirts and pants that you could wear. Oh no, they did sliding shorts too. So they did long shirts and like compression shorts that you could wear. That's all they made for years. That's all they did. But what happened is that they built up a reputation for being excellent and elite at what they did. So then when they launched uh, other things, people said, well, I'm familiar with that company. I know their reputation. I know that what they do, they do well. And they trusted them. They trusted their shoes and their backpacks. Now they're the primary supplier of clothing for the United States Army, which is not a bad uh, gig to get if you're a clothing manufacturer, Um, right? That's a an unlimited water hose of money, of our money, amen. So, so there, Under Armour is doing fine. Um, and, I, uh, and so one of the reasons that I see people fail is because they don't start strong. They, they immediately let themselves off the hook of excellence on day one because they justify mediocrity by saying, well, I'm new. And the second reason that I see people um, fail uh, to fulfill their vows or to follow through with their commitments is because they, they fade out. And that is that they don't stay strong. You know, after starting strong, possibly, they grow in compromise or complacency as a, uh, and they fail as a result. Now, um, I, there's nothing in me that would ever start something poorly. If I'm going to do, I love starting things. If I'm going to start something, I'm going to start it really, really well. My problem is I'm bored after a month and I'm ready to start something new. It's like, let's go. You know, we're going to plant 10 more churches this year. Not really. That's not true. But I could, like I'm, I would be thrilled to do that. And I have to continually come back to what does God say and how can I uh, it, just the other day, I was thinking, we've been doing this for four years. It'll be four years in, in January, officially, but, but even prior to that, we were meeting in my house. Four years ago today, we were meeting in, in my house. We've been having weekly meetings for more than four years, and, uh, <laughs> and I thought, I can't believe I'm not bored yet. Like, this is, it literally is a miracle that I'm still here, honestly. <laughs> I should have had some word from the Lord to become a missionary in Sweden, you know, th- Three and a half years ago. I, I don't know how I ended up here. <laughs> it's, only, it's only by the grace of God. Now, th- and so the other group, this is the one I can really relate to. It's not people that don't start strong. It's people that don't stay strong. Those are the ones that fade out. After starting strong, they grow in compromise or complacency. Now, compromise might look like um, this is going great, and I want it to go even better, so I'm going to cut some corners here and there. I'm going to start to decrease my quality so I can increase my quantity because I started so strong. I've got to make sure that that supply can keep up with demand. Do not do that. In ministry, in business, in life, do not lower the quality of what you do just so that you can do more. Take the time to do things that God has called you to do at an elite level. If you're going to clean your bathroom, clean your bathroom like a professional. This is what I mean. I'm I'm not just talking this. I understand this could sound like business strategy. That's not what I'm talking about at all. If you're going to take your spouse on a date, crush that date. Take them on an amazing, creative, fun, innovative date. Right? Like if, if you're, if, you know, if my son wants to play football and I'd like to see him succeed, it's like, yes, coach, I will volunteer to coach this football team with you 
so I can make sure my son has the best experience possible. You know, all the other kids, they're out there running plays and I'm whispering in his ear, hey, next time, try it this way, right? It's like, I, I, I wanna do what I do at an elite level. I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of hours I have spent watching videos on how to coach football. <laughs> I'm not good. It, like, I wasn't a football coach. I didn't play football growing up. I don't know anything about it. Like, my wife had to teach me what a linebacker was. <laughs> I'm still not sure what the difference is between a tackle and a guard, but, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I know some good wide receiver drills. I've really helped these boys a lot. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, I, I want you to understand, I'm not just talking about business development strategy. What I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, is that if you're going to give your time to anything, Take whatever time, whatever focus, whatever attention is necessary for you to be elite, excellent, and high integrity at that thing. Make sure that you're a person that doesn't just start strong, but that you're a person also who stays strong. Our standard for successful endurance, thank God, is not the person down the street or the people who've gone before us or even the person that we used to be. Our standard, our aim is Christ himself. That's what success looks like. And Christ endured to the end. He finished what he started. He persevered through rejection, through hardship, through disappointment, through pain. And he declared one word that would stand forever as a reminder that kingdom people finish what they start. This Greek word, tell, tell us, die. It is finished. It is the triumphant announcement of the completion of the path he was called to walk. Jesus finished what he started. And so we, as those who follow him, will finish what we start to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to tell you, um, I don't normally do this, but I have a gift for you today. Uh, Mandy, do we have those somewhere? So Miss Mandy's got these. So we, I had these bracelets made because I felt like this was gonna be a message I wanted to remember. I've got this bracelet here that says, start strong, stay strong. Because there is a, uh, a declaration that, that I wanna make over myself that I won't just be a person that starts strong. I'll be a person that remains strong year after year after year after year in the things that God has given me to do. Listen, I don't want to just passionately pursue my wife long enough that she'll marry me and then get distracted and start pursuing other things. I don't just want to passionately pursue the, the, the call that God's given me for this church or this ministry long enough to get it off the ground and then get distracted and start running after other things. I want to be someone that starts strong and that stays strong, that continually walks the path that God has laid before me with character, with excellence, and with integrity in every level. I want to be the kind of man that roasts what he kills, that keeps his vows, and that honors God with his integrity. And so before you leave today, right in front of both doors, there's going to be a bracelet for you. If you want to grab one or two or however many, I don't know how, we got a lot of them. So if you want to grab one for your your mom or whoever you think needs one, uh, (laughs) Feel free to grab a couple extras. We're not going to do anything with them after this, so hopefully they're all gone. Take them, give them out. Um, I, I want you to be reminded to remain. And I would love to hear, if you've been convicted these last couple weeks and the Lord has given you clarity or confirmation about maybe a project that you had put on a shelf and forgotten to come back to, something that you've started but hadn't finished that you're recommitting to, I would love to hear that from you and, and be able to cheer you on as you run toward that finish line and then maybe also be able to tap you on the shoulder if you forget and get distracted again, amen? Um, so Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that, that you've placed a, a great call and a holy assignment on every one of our lives. Lord, we thank you that, um, that we, we are not just working for you, we're working with you 
in partnership with you and that you've called us to do so with excellence, with integrity, with perseverance and determination to finish what we start. Lord, I pray that you would deal with laziness in us, deal with laziness in me, with with the members of this church, God. Would you bring conviction and direction to us, bring revelation to us that would uh, give us the the, the courage, the grace, the vision to be able to, uh, to see through to completion everything that you've given us, Lord. Make us the kind of people that don't just start strong, the kind of people that finish everything that you've given us that can cross the finish line with our heads held high, with a smile on our face, knowing that we can say at the end of it all, tell, tell us die, it is finished. Just like Jesus, our great standard has done before us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. I pray special blessing over every person in this room, even those watching online right now. God, would you meet us, mark us, use us for your glory to exalt your name and to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Family, bless you, love you so much. Make sure you grab your bracelet on the way out and we will see you uh, Sunday, uh, sorry, Wednesday night at 6.30 and next Sunday at 10. Blessings, thanks. <laughs>